This episode of Talking With Tech is brought to you by Smartbox, makers of Grid3 and Grid for iPad, a complete symbol and text AAC solution. And by Twiddle, the safe sensory therapy tool that can reduce stress and stimulate brain function in children with autism and sensory seeking behaviors. Well, welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. My name is Lucas Stuber, joined as always by Rachel Madel. How are you? I'm doing good. And Mr. Chris Begay, how are you? I'm fantastic. Lucas, I love your shirt. That is the <laughs> coolest shirt ever. Thank you. I'm wearing a, a Talking <laughs> With is. Tech uh, shirt. Um, congratulations also to the, one of our, our awesome listeners who just won a Talking With Tech shirt, which is why I'm actually wearing one. Was I, just, I, I had to order a large after having a medium prior. I don't know what that says about my, my lifestyle recently, but uh, I, got, I got myself one too. Um, I, I can't announce that person's name uh, yet because I don't have permission, but I'm, I'm excited to be joined by Susan Berkowitz. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fantastic. So I think that uh, the majority of our crew today is actually in the ca greater California region. This is kind of interesting. That's right. Um, but Susan, you're joining us from Mexico, right? I am in Baja at the moment, yes. Fantastic. I'm going to count that as an international guest, and we yeah, will absolutely. advertise this as such. <laughs> um, well, um, Susan, we're really excited to have you. I mean, the, the big, uh, one of the big topics that's on, I think, everyone's mind right now is this, uh, the transition into summer, right? And what that looks like for a lot of our school-age students and, of course, the professionals that are working in schools. And um, one thing that we want to sort of talk about and afford them access to is online resources and things they may not have access, to, you know, as they move away from the district for the summer, that sort of thing. And um, you're certainly, a, uh, I, I don't know if pioneer is the right word, but um, a leader in that area. Um, but if you could, I, I guess, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do. Uh, well, I've been a speech and language pathologist for 40 years. I've been working with kids with autism for 44 or five years running out of counting skills here, but, um, and it's, yeah, it's really kind of been my passion. Um, I was working with non-speaking kids with autism back in the 70s. Um, there were no symbol supports. There, <laughs> bliss symbols were just sort of popping up. Um, we taught kids how to sign, um, although it was not sign language. I started out in psychology, sort of wandered through special education, ended up in speech pathology, because what I was doing was teaching kids to communicate. So, um, and that's what I've been doing ever since. I have worked with Alcom for all of those years. I've watched it change uh, for the better. Thank you. <laughs> Susan, what did iPads look like back in the 70s? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they were on Star Trek still, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, we were we were lucky if we had a color printer. <laughs> Mostly, we well, tore pictures out of magazines. <laughs> I think I think a lot of SLPs are still lucky to have a color printer. I, in schools, nobody's got one. Um, it's the bane of everybody's existence, and um, and that's a problem because for a lot of our kids, they really need those color in pictures, not just the black and white. Although there are probably more kids who could live with black and white than we realize because we've gotten so used to color, and color was great in symbols when it came out, and so many kids did better with them. Um, but yes, yeah, school districts are not too um, interested in funding all that color ink, um, and, and all of the resources that we use are very ink intensive. I, I had a whole practical rotation that I think could have just been called laminator repair. Yeah. <laughs> I have burned through quite a number of those over the years. <laughs> Parent volunteers are great at laminating and putting Velcro on things. I, I've had yeah, kids. I, I keep discovering in school districts that, that there aren't those parent volunteers so much anymore. I'm really saddened. <laughs> those were a great resource. In, in my experience, your mileage may vary, right? Like, I mean, it really depends on which district and which school. Some have yeah, like a huge absolutely. culture with that. I, what, what are we laminating, right? So we're thinking about these resources. Um, I'm thinking about the summer slide concept, right? Okay. You wrote about this recently. So what, what is the summer slide? Well, when kids are away from uh, the classroom and therapies um, and not getting that intensive instruction for you know, several hours a day, it's uh, really difficult for them to keep up the skills if there isn't somebody keeping up with them. Um, and when they come back to school at the end of August or September, um, they have 
you know, lost some skills. They've regressed a little bit because they don't remember it. It's been too long. And so we really need to find a way to get them through that. Um, summer school, which used to be sort of everywhere for almost every special ed kid, um, has been cut back as budgets get cut back and, and staff get cut back. And so um, where summer school used to be, you know, six or seven weeks, um, it's now lucky if it's two or three some places. And that's just not enough for, for kids and, and parents are left scrambling. And they've likely not gotten a lot of training from the school district in terms of what to do and how to do it. Um, and that's problematic. You know, I wonder if that summer slide wouldn't happen no matter what, because I know in certain school districts, even if it was six or seven weeks, you know, let's say they did have longer summer school, the staff that is working with them mm -hmm. are not the same staff that have worked all school year long. And no, often it's a, great point. a warm body that we can get mm -hmm. in there to cover summer school. And so they still don't know anything about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so unless there's someone there training them, it's almost like no matter where you go, it's almost like you really need a, a year round program uh, yeah. and a restructuring for if you're a student with a communication device, then you should be in a program that is year round as opposed to, um, hey, you just arbitrarily at the end of this, you know, comes June, this is the day that it's done and sorry, now you get these months yeah. off. Like, uh, but that would be a huge systematic change for people. Absolutely. So maybe, maybe something we start advocating for, you know? Yeah. One of the other problems is whether or not kids have their AAC system with them over the summer. Um, if they've got a high-tech device, um, even if it's only a lowly iPad, uh, they're still considered too expensive for the districts to let go of them, to let them go home over the summer. Districts are always worried about them getting damaged or lost. And while that's a viable concern, this is the kid's voice. You know, you don't slap tape across your mouth when you walk out the door in June and not talk to anybody until September comes around. It's just not realistic to think that kids don't need to communicate all summer. Um, and I know districts, some of them just don't allow it. Some of them are great and everybody can take them home. Others need parents to prove that they have homeowner's insurance or something similar. Um, so again, even if the kid um, has somebody working with him over the summer, he likely doesn't have his communication system. And we know that having the same system and having the same words and having to be in the same location is really important, but they lose that. I, I understand the reasons why people look at this from like a pure like actuarial standpoint of like, yeah. I, you know, we don't want to lose X number of iPads over the summer, but it's, it's unconscionable. This isn't curriculum that's being left at home. And it's not a leisure activity. It's way too important and schools don't seem to grasp that. One strategy that might really help there is um, I think the entire reason we have IEPs in the first place is to prevent that sort of nonsense from happening, right? And so it's not really should be an IEP team decision that says, should it go home or shouldn't go home uh, every day and over the summer and all of that should be part of the, the IEP team. It shouldn't be a district saying, no, IEP team, you can't do that. It's the IEP team that trumps the district, right? Well, so that could Strategy. Except that the IEP team is mostly made up of district staff. If the parent is only one voice in a sea of, you know, 10 or 12, it's, um, you know, 9 to 1. It doesn't happen. Well, Talking With Tech is brought to you by Smartbox, makers of AAC solution Grid 3 for Windows and Grid for iPad. Grid is a complete symbol and text AAC system that is designed for individuals of different ages and ability levels. Uh, Grid is a single AAC system that can progress with the user as he or she grows. One thing I like about Grid is it includes SuperCore, a research-based core word vocabulary grid. SuperCore gives users a home grid of core words that's combined with activity-specific vocabulary. Grid also has a simplified editing process, allowing you to do anything from editing a cell to creating a new grid with a few taps or clicks. Grid also provides remote editing and cloud backup. With a Smartbox account, you can auto-sync content between Grid 3 and Grid for iPad. This allows anyone with a Windows computer and a free trial of Grid 3 to edit grid sets from anywhere, and the changes appear instantly in Grid for iPad. Your content is stored in the cloud and backed up, 
so you won't lose content if you lose your device. So right now, you can try Grid for free. Visit thinksmartbox.com for a free 30 or 60-day trial for either Grid 3 or Grid for iPad. This will allow you to evaluate the features of Grid, including simplified editing, remote syncing, uh, you know, let you decide if Grid is the right solution for you or your client. Um, again, visit thinksmartbox.com for that free trial. We hope you do. I have a question kind of going off of that, Susan, and I guess to the rest of the team, it, you know, for the speech therapists out there and, you know, maybe we're a little late because the school year is pretty much already ended, um, you know, but for the SLPs out there who are in this exact situation, you know, they have a, a few kids on their caseload who are using devices, they're not going to be able to take them home for the summer. What are some ways that, you know, they can advocate, you know, to their districts to try to get those systems home with kids? I have not found a good one. Um, districts all seem nowadays to have somebody called a risk assessor. And That's the <laughs> how actual. the lawyers got yeah. in on special education, I don't know. But, but these are guys who are only looking at the bottom line, who are only looking at the possible risks. They don't like um, outside consultants going into classrooms because that could be a risk. They don't want um, equipment from the school district going home because that's another risk. So I, I think for the most part, we advocate reasonably well for this is the way the child communicates. He needs to keep communicating. He can't communicate if you don't give him his communication system. I think we just need to keep saying that over and over and over again. Yeah. One of the things that I try and do um, if I'm running into a brick wall there is just say, fine, take screenshots of every page that this kid uses, print them out, put on tabs, give him a communication book. So at least he's got something that looks like what he uses all the time. Uh, so I have a couple thoughts here. One is I would love to hear from listeners because I know the picture that we're painting right now is definitely not universal. I mean, I don't work in a school district right now that, that doesn't allow kids to bring their stuff home for the summer. Um, and I wonder, you know, how, uh, how prevalent that is. Like, is that a concern we should be uh, addressing at a national level? The second thought would be, um, depending on the communication system, uh, it might be relatively inexpensive. Now, again, this might be coming from a place where it's like, well, an $800 communication system, Chris, is really expensive. But in the scope of someone's life, you know, would you pay $800 to have language for your life? Uh, and there's definitely different ways to do that. Funding options it could be a whole different episode just on alternative funding. So I, I almost wonder if school districts aren't pushing parents unknowingly, these school districts that are, are doing this to, to families, uh, unknowingly pushing them to say, well, then we'll just buy our own device. And we'll do our own thing. And then we're going to impose it on you. We'll have this other fight where you think it should be system A and we've decided it's going to be system B. And now we're going to say, we're oh, gonna... that's a whole other fight. <laughs> I know. I know. And I've seen plenty of those parents. Um, and often, even if now, nowadays, more and more, even school districts are just buying the iPads, not the high end devices. And, um, and yeah, parents who can afford it are actually just going out and getting what the kid has, and that's fine. And then you've got pockets of parents who, who can't, who just cannot. They're, you know, lucky they feed their family um, every night. And then it gets to be a hardship. But, yeah, why shouldn't those kids have the same access as everybody else? Um, I, they, yeah, they, pay I, taxes. they pay taxes like everybody else for the public school system. So why yeah, shouldn't they have that? Exactly. Right? Well, I, I honestly, I think this is probably part of the the reason why there has been such a shift towards like the iPad as opposed to a dedicated communication device because so many kids were not going home with them. I, which is to say, I, I hear less about it now than I did maybe five years ago. If yes. that makes any sense. Like, yes. I don't think it's any less of an issue, but I think that yes. people have can afford their own stuff. But then what it leads to also is exactly Chris, as you articulated, that suddenly we have a different communication system being used at home, uh, you know, then at school. And then often there's two devices that need to be maintained or synced, even if it is, uh, you know, the same system. Um, it makes me think again more about the uh, – the parents, uh, you know, of, of these students, like what, I guess, what can we do to prepare to support them leading into um, the summer months? I think schools need to be better about um, helping to train parents. 
on the one hand, you'll get school staff to go, well, the parents don't carry over, you know, what we do at home, so, you know, why should we bother doing it? And, um, and I think that that's kind of unfair to parents. Um, so many of them really want to know what to do and how to do it. They want their kid to communicate. Um, when I do now, I've been a consultant for the last eh, two decades, um, as opposed to working for a particular district or, or any place. And so I'm in a lot of districts, and I, I see a wide variety. There are districts who will happily give a kid an iPad, pick an AAC app, any AAC app, and we're good to go. And others who are still reluctant to go that length, um, give them a communication board on a piece of paper, and, and that's all they get. So it, it does really still vary. I have districts where I can say you need to send this home over the summer, and they will. And other districts, they're not going to do it. Um, I've had school districts videotape my trainings so that they can show it to parents um, sometime when they can watch. And I think that's a good idea. I, I always tell uh, people I'm available by email. Shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer your questions. And, and then I think we need to point them in the right direction um, where those parents who can aren't and are able uh, to understand uh, what they read on the internet and, and parse out what's important, we can provide them with some online resources where they can get some training or get their questions answered. There are uh, several really good series of online uh, webinars that have been created. Uh, Carolyn Musselwhite did, and Erin Sheldon did a great series for the Angelman Syndrome Foundation. And that's there, it's free, and, um, and the videos are very well done. It's very well explained. And it, yeah, it's, I wanna, I'll double down on that one, especially I, I've used Erin Sheldon's presentation there specifically as a model for some things that I've tried to do. So don't watch mine, watch hers. <laughs> hers are way better. <laughs> Well, and I think you hit on one, one thing that's interesting, too, is that, like, I don't want SLPs working in the schools to feel like we're saying that they didn't do a good enough job for not preparing yeah. these kids for the summer, if that makes any sense. We're all doing the best with our time all the time. Uh, and I don't want parents to feel that way either. Like, is there anything that a parent could be doing at home that would be, like, harmful from an AAC standpoint in terms of modeling or any of this? I'm not so sure that there is anything. I think um, if you're, you know, trying to encourage your child to communicate that's fabulous. I, I try very heavily to discourage parents from doing the test me, test me kind of thing. Show me, you know, show me the drink, show me the m and show me the... Yes, good, thank uh, you. And there are SLPs and teachers who do that too. I think we're all um, guilty of it. And certainly for a lot of years, a lot of us did it. And did we harm people? I don't know. But we weren't doing it right. Um, and now we know better. And I think because the field is still relatively young, there are a lot of things that we've learned as we've gone along. There are a lot of things some of us have done wrong for a lot of years, but, um, but we learn as the research comes out and our experience grows and we see more and more kids using these systems. I think we learn more of the right things to do, um, but I'm still not sure that there's a lot that can be harmfully done um, in the space of a, a couple of months. Uh, that being said, yes, I have seen kids got, get turned off um, during device trials by parents, like I said, who are so anxious that they want the kid to get it right, they want the kid to get it right, and that's been problematic um, occasionally uh, in some trials that I've seen. But for the most part, just talk to your kid, play with your kid. That's really what you need to do. And that's part of your job as a parent, play with them and talk to them. And, and that's what I do. And people come in when I'm doing assessments and they watch and it's like, well, when's the assessment going to start? This is it, honey. <laughs> I am sitting here and I am playing with your kid and we're going to figure out what he can say and, and how far I can push him and where that goes. Um, this is it. This, this is the assessment. I'm not an awesome job. We have yeah. <laughs> it is. It's, it's great. There actually have been a number of blog posts and I think I did one uh, a couple of years ago about, you know, all we do is play and teachers, teachers get that a lot in, in school districts. They look at the SLPs, they go, you just play. You've got a really easy job. <laughs> um, and sometimes it is, it's really awesome. Um, I could, you know, spend all day and used to um, sitting and reading books to kids. 
and talking about them. And that's, that was my therapy. And so I think the more we can get parents and SLPs accustomed to the idea that you don't really need to do anything all that different. Doing implementation for AAC is really similar to what we do for implementation of almost any SLP goal that we've got. Yep. So yep. maybe articulation, right? <laughs> but, um, but language is language. You gotta teach the kid language. And so it's what you know. It's what we as SLPs know how to do and, and do best. The kid's just not gonna talk to you. He's gonna use this alternate voice. So I think we can give parents a lot of confidence if we say, just do what you do with your other kids. I, I can distinctly remember mm, about 10 years ago, I was doing some consulting with a family and I had only interacted with uh, the wife, the mom, and the kids. And finally there was a, a time when the father was there and he was, he was so anxious about it. And I would say, Here's what you do. Sit down and, and you're reading books with both, you know, the kid and his brother. And here are some things you can do while you're reading. And he kept saying, well, what else can I do? What, what can I really do? What's better to do? <laughs> and, and I could not convince him that, here, sit and read the story. Here are some things you can do to point out vocabulary or to talk about concepts or ask comprehension questions, prediction, what, all of this stuff that you're doing with your other son, do it with him too. And let him use his pictures to answer. And I've seen other parents who just, the light bulb goes on and it's, ah, I can relax. I know how to do this. I have the same things come up in my own practice. And it's like, if it's not direct teaching to people, they feel like something's not right. You know, yeah. this isn't working. This isn't what it's supposed to be. Um, you know, but kids learn best through play and language is everywhere, as we all know. But it's just sometimes is really challenging to articulate that to parents because they just feel like if they don't see something that looks like teaching, yeah. that it must not be working. Yeah. It, it is It is sort of funny that parents think that, that it has to be that way. Like that, it's so funny what you said, Rachel, was like... Um, that if they don't have this vision of what teaching is, and even mm -hmm. that is changing for schools, right? And I think that's yeah. becoming a little bit easier for uh, for speech therapists and teachers to wrap their brains around, but it's the community that is not. Like, so when I say the word teacher, people picture someone standing in front of a chalkboard lecturing to a classroom of kids. And that whole mentality is changing where it's yeah. like, you go into a classroom now and it's, it's, it's organized chaos, you know, kind of like what you were describing in your, uh, exactly. your therapy session, you know, and I, that same mentality then can be applied to teaching someone language is that, look, this is, there's a, there, there is a plan here, but it's a little, yeah. looks a little more chaotic than what you would think of like strapping a kid down and go, say ball, say ball, you say ball, you know? Yeah, I, it, it really is changing and, and for the better. And I think um, if we can get, all of the communication partners to kind of relax and realize that, you know, it's, think of it as, as project-based learning. And the project for this week is we're talking about winter words. And of course, not here in San Diego, but in a lot of places, those are things like, you know, skiing and shoveling and digging and sliding and, um, and all of those core words and let's talk about describing them and let's talk about other vocabulary for winter. And that's what we're doing. And we can do it all sorts of ways. We can make fake snow and we can build little fake snow snowmen and we can do all sorts of things that that's fun. And we're going to talk about it at the same time. Yep. That's a good opportunity to collaborate with OT and other disciplines mm -hmm. as well. And other kids, right? I mean, if the project-based learning is happening in your school, then the chances are it's happening for all the other kids. And it, the, the, one of the principal tenets of project-based learning is that there's an authentic problem that you're solving. You're not just doing a project isn't like, let's make a horse today out of paper. Like, no, it's the horses are all sick and we have to come up with a way to help the horses, you know, or, and so what's a great authentic problem is we have friends in our school that need to learn language using these systems and devices. Mm -hmm. How do we teach it to them? Well, let's make some stuff together, guys, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're, we're getting better. I mean, I'm not, I, I haven't been um, supervising grad students recently, so I don't know what the grad programs so much look like anymore. 
but I, I hope that as we're training more speech pathologists and special education teachers, that we're getting this knowledge into their hands of how to do this better, of let's do it not the way we did it 20 years ago or 40 years ago. Um, and I wanna say that, that I think it's happening. I think we're getting this participation model down a little bit better. Um, and, and training people for that kind of um, intervention and assessment, uh, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So if you've got a better pulse, beat on pulse of, of training programs these days, I'd love to hear it. In, in your time, uh, you must see the, the, the emergence of core words and how everybody yes. is talking about core words. That has to be, right? I mean, you notice a big change there. Yeah, or, that's, um, that's huge. Um, and, you know, I was one of those SLPs um, team years ago who sat and figured out all the sentences that somebody needed to say and tried to figure out, you know, how many squares I could put them in and what was it going to be able to say. And, yeah, we, we all did it. <laughs> and now we know that we were really dumb. Um, nobody wanted to say all of those things. And we didn't give them any way to generate what they did want to say. So, um, yeah, I am... Um, I've gotten better about core words, and I think the field in general has. I think we're doing a lot more to, um, to talk about generative language with severely disordered kids, disabled kids. And I, I think that's been a huge growth, um, the notion that these kids can learn words and learn how to put them together rather than us needing to create sentences for them all the time. And not just the words, but all the little parts of words, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't you write, write a post yeah. about that? The, the little more Absolutely. Piece? We, we, um, we tend to neglect um, all that morphosyntactic stuff. Um, and, you know, if we teach a kid, I want X, we think we've done a good job. Um, and we haven't. Even if we've taught him to put together the individual symbols for I and one and cookie. Uh, we, we're still not giving them the tools to develop language. They, they need those. Janice Light um, once talked about AAC systems as just being compilations of semantic categories that really didn't get us anywhere language-wise. And she was absolutely right. And if you take a look at the systems that do have those features, they're all... Um, Mm, a little difficult to use. It's, it's another step. It's an extra thing to think about. And when you think about it, AAC users are uh, likely our most language disordered, communicatively challenged kids, and yet we ask them to do the most complex linguistic tasks every time we ask them to talk. We don't sit and think about, all right, I want to talk about this thing on my foot, and so it's something to wear, so I need to go to the clothing file box in my head and find the thing that goes on. We don't do that. Right. Um, it's I'm all, like, oh, by the way, you have, you have no real exposure to language in the, in, the, in the manner in which you're going to be using it, but here's semantic compaction. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and so then we've got, um, we've got kids who have to think, okay, I found the shoe, but I've got two of them, so now I have to find the button that has the S on the end of it. Um, it's, it's not easy, and we don't spend nearly enough time giving the kids the tools they need to use those things. Um, and we give up too easily. We say, all right, he can label all the things in his environment, and he can ask for stuff, we're good. I'm a big fan of toys, I'm a big fan of sensory tools, uh, and I'm a big fan of really creative ideas. So I was at a conference a little while ago and I ran into this company called Twiddle, T-W-I-D-D-L-E. And they make these soft therapeutic aids that assist caregivers, people who specialize in autism or ADHD, developmental disabilities, even memory care and arthritis. They almost look like a hand muff that you, you put your hands into. They have them in the shape of dogs, the shape of cats. Oh, that's so fuzzy and adorable. There's one called the, the Nathan that has a whole bunch of like uh, its own fidgets on it, like a, like a chewy, like a crinkly bag. They're warm. Each one of them has like a, like a stress ball uh, at the center of it that you can squeeze. There's a, a storage bag with a zipper. Uh, these things are really neat. I love sensory items, especially for kids with autism. They're a game changer.
They sound awesome. They sound like something I want to play with. Yeah, in fact, it's really comfortable. They're really durable and they're machine washable, uh, which is huge. I can't tell you how many times, especially in my clinic, I've had to just throw away stuff. Uh, I highly recommend it, and I think uh, I can't think of a kid that wouldn't uh, enjoy playing with one of these. So check it out, twiddle.speechnines.org. Lucas, you asked a question a while ago, uh, you know, like what, what not to do. And uh, I think what you're talking about here is when we're giving people the, the tools they need is that we said modeling, right? We've did a whole episode on modeling. It's going to keep coming yeah. up, right? Modeling. And so I would often say that to, to, to teachers, like you got to model on the device. And so then I'd come back and I'd say, look, we're modeling, Chris. And what I do is I tell them, sit, do, uh, get it. And like, yeah, you're giving him commands on the device all the time. And that is modeling, but there, I guarantee you, he will yes. hate you and hate that device if every time. Absolutely. <laughs> when we, when we programmed in full sentences into these things, it was, um, it was the same kind of thing. Okay. So I want the device to say, sit down, be quiet, fold your hands. And I'm like, wait a minute. I want to know what he wants to say. You've yeah. got a voice. <laughs> and, um, and that's, always a big struggle. Um, I've, I've always felt that way about, and, and this is controversial, I think, so maybe you guys can, can jump in, but uh, you know, when you have a device that maybe has eight words on it and please is one of them, oh, God. you know, I and, I, well, and, and like, I think it's, I think it's like a, a way of cheating to hire MLU, if that makes any sense, like, which I, I which I mean, like you can extend every sentence by just attaching please to it, you know, <laughs> but is it, what really is that like really that meaningful pragmatically? Um, I have uh, consulted to an agency um, in Southern California that runs about three dozen group homes, um, kids with autism, adults with autism and developmental disabilities. And I cannot begin to tell you how many middle-aged to older clients um, are living in group homes who know two signs, please and thank you. Yeah. They have no idea what they mean. They just know if they do this thing, Something happens. Yeah. Yep. And that, that, means, that means snack, that means break, that yeah. means whatever. Right. right. Sure. You've given him a way to let you know that he wants to say something. And but more. you still haven't given him a way to figure out what it is he wants. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you're following him around every room of the house trying to figure out what he wants. And it's probably not even something within those walls. Um, and, and it's really frustrating. I've had that literal precise experience of being led by the hand for 30 yeah. minutes while a kid is just signing please. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, I want to know. I want to know. I really do. Okay. Yeah. And it sounded like Rachel agreed with me too on the please thing. So I feel, I feel pretty good. I, yeah, I, I've, I'm just like, I have so many feelings about it. Honestly, it's, if we have eight words, we're going to choose some type of formality that means nothing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, it's so frustrating to me. And a lot of times parents are the ones that are like, well, I want them to be able to say thank you. Yeah. We need him to say thank you. We need him to say please when he asks for what he wants. And I'm like, listen, like, w yes, for, you know, a typically developing toddler, you want them to learn how to say please and thank you. But for a child who has such struggle with learning language, um, you know, we can't, first of all, we have to be strategic about the words we're choosing. And second of all, you know, we can't throw at them some like, you know, abstract formality that, you know, is just, you know, added to be polite. But it just, it, it means nothing to them. Yeah. I, I get um, through to some people when I talk about real estate. Yes. How much real estate do you have on this board or this device? How, how much real estate on any given page in this system? And what are the key things that are really, really necessary to say? Um, you know, and you get a lot of, of people who will say that, you know, even programming or, or creating buttons for wants and needs is kind of irrelevant because largely wants and needs get met. Um, a, another place where you really, really see this a lot is in group homes where you get clients who kind of don't need to say very much because all of their wants and needs get met. The, the day is routinized. You don't have to say anything um, unless something is, you know, hurting so bad that you're banging your head against a wall. To say, and then what happens is we say, well, they're unmotivated to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not really motivated. Well, you're giving them everything that they don't need to do anything. They, yeah, no there, is, there is right. no motivation. Um, so, yeah, and that's, that's really hard. 
And motivation is not always to get an M&M. Uh, I'm sorry that I spent that many years walking around with M&Ms in my pocket, but, um, but we did that. <laughs> Some people probably still do. Uh, this is great. We, we, so we've, we've addressed a little bit of like motivating clinicians and motivating parents over the summer. But one challenge I think also is that kids are now reentering an environment for where like 24 seven, they're surrounded by mind readers, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to be around their family all the time. So how do we maintain that? You know, I want to say communicative temptation, but that, that, that motivation to communicate in that environment. Yeah. Like do we, do we, do we engage in sabotage throughout the day? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. you teach parents how to do it. And, you know, we don't do it all the time. You know, I say things like do it judiciously. Do not cut the apple into 32 slices and make a mask for each one of them. But maybe cut it into quarters or eighths. Um, he asks for book A, give him book B. Give him a chance to say, no, not that one, something different. Um, any of those kinds of things. So I think teaching parents how to do some of that um, is, is very important and, um, and helpful. And yes, it varies. I've seen parents who are so frustrated because they say, I still don't know what he wants. Um, so they are more motivated to try all of these techniques that, that we're teaching them. Um, and we have some, some parents um, who say, oh, I know what he wants. I don't really need him to tell me. Okay, you know what he wants. What else can you talk about? All right, you've got that. If you know what he wants and what he wants is a uh, Thomas the Train video, fine, we're going to watch Thomas the Train video and we're going to talk about it. We're going to stop and we're going to say, like, was that funny or was that sad? What do you think is going to happen? Turn it back on and talk about what, what you're doing. You're taking your kids to the beach because you have got to get them all out of the house <laughs> before they drive you crazy sit and build sand castles, you know, knock something down and, and say, oh, uh oh, what happened? What should I do? What do we need more of? Whatever you would say to the other kids in your family who are building sand castles with you. Right. That's and, that's, and that's the way we interact with kids often, right? Is we, we engage yeah. with what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, that's, you know, one of my core principles of intervention is that like, if, if, if I want what I'm doing to generalize anywhere past like the quote unquote speech room, then it has to be about something that kid wants to talk about with their exactly. people. And, and so like, that's great. Like Chris brought up earlier, like an ideal scenario is to actually have peers involved or like, I love project-based learning, like that sort of stuff during the school year is great. But if you have like, I, I, you know, I had a situation in private practice where I had a single child that I would go and see in home and he had sort of a, I don't know, I guess I would call it like a, like an indoor jungle gym, sort of like a sensory sort of setup that he had that had a swing and a variety of other things. And the first like three or four times that I met with him, he did, he wanted nothing to do with me. Like he did not care if I was in his environment. He would, if I tried to like come over and scooch to him and model in some fun way, he would just crawl over me and like be gone like yeah. to the next book. Yeah. And, um, but he loved this chair in the middle of the room, this one swing. And so finally there, there came a day where for 45 minutes, I just sat and swung in that thing myself. And, uh, <laughs> and I didn't build him for the session, by the way, but, uh, but I pretty much waited until he walked up and gave me this look like, what, like, why are you taking my favorite thing? And then yeah. finally it was like, Hey, here's something we can talk about, you know? And so I, I hate to <laughs> promote theft of toys as an intervention. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes it works. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if what he wants to talk about is that one favorite thing and I can't engage him yeah. for four sessions, then that one favorite thing is going to go on the top shelf. Exactly. Right. And then, you know, then we're going to have to engage about it. And, you know, in the home, it's always really interesting to see yeah. what the home environment setup is like. Um, you know, and for a lot of the kids that I'm seeing who aren't communicating and all of their needs are being met, it's because there's toys everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I like, I'm like, oh, I have, I have, you know, your favorite toy. But as soon as I take it, then it's on to the next toy. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of what I have the, you know, the good fortune to do in the homes is say like, okay, listen, if we really want to get serious about expanding, you know, language and requesting and all these things beyond just a few things. And we really need to look at the environment. How can we set up the environment in a way where, you know, he's not getting everything he needs. Yeah. Um, and that means putting things up on high shelves and in, you know, containers that can't be, you know, got into without saying help or open. Um, right. So it's, it's nice when you have the ability to work in the home with parents because um, you can actually see um, and give feedback on, you know, tangible things that they can start doing to facilitate these communication interactions. Um, it's not always, you know, possible in the schools, um, but I think that's one thing that's been really helpful in my own practice. 
You yeah. know, I think that's a strategy, whether you have a using AAC or not, like just, just a general good kid strategy, like mm -hmm. pick up the, put them away because when the toys are all over, kids will just kind of wander around and like be bored and like, he's got all these toys and he never plays with them. Right. And when you put them in the way, there's this sense of discovery when you open the lid of the toy chest and you have to go through it. It's like, Oh, there's that thing that is not, but when it's mm -hmm. out and everyone can see it, well then you don't, it just becomes part of your, your chaos. Do you know what I mean? And going off of that too, one of the best things that my mom did when we were growing up was she would cycle our toys. Mm -hmm. So we would, she would put our toys away and, you know, they'd go up in the attic and, you know, every month or two she would bring down a box and it was like Christmas. And it was toys that we already had. Uh, we just hadn't seen them, you know, in a month or two. And it was really exciting. Oh, I should do that with my gadgets to myself. I like that. <laughs> I, I, let me, I want to leap on that too and add that, like, if you have like a snack screen or like a, like a food screen or whatever, I have also had seen situations where people will sort of like only make the things that are currently available present on that screen to avoid conflict or whatever. And I was going to say like, this is not a menu. Okay. Yeah. This is like, <laughs> This is a communicative opportunity. It's actually great if we don't have one of those things That's because right. we can. Yeah, you stuff. have to talk about it and negotiate for something else. And yeah, absolutely. One of the um, greatest experiences I had back in the hmm, 80s was um, being able to go to uh, Gail McGee's integrated preschool program at UMass Amherst. And um, they did, a, they wrote a lot of the research on incidental teaching. And we were, we were working towards more incidental teaching and less discrete trial training, mass trials, and how that could work in an environment where it wasn't just all special needs kids. And how did you get kids talking to each other and about things? What would be the definition of incidental teaching? Incidental teaching is um, sort of teaching that happens in the naturally occurring environment. So we create, there are lots of opportunities for kids to learn things. Our, our normal kids or neurotypical kids learn a lot of language incidentally. They, um, they hear us saying things and they see the context that it's in or what it's attached to and they build their skills um, through that. Modified incidental teaching, which is what I really should have said, is when we take that kind of occurring times, incidents to teach, and we structure them a little bit. We modify the environment. So now we call it, you know, temptations and sabotage. It's an amazing way to teach, and it's been done since the 50s with folks with language disorders and developmental dis disorders. That's when Hart and Risley were first doing their research. Um, and so it it's around, and I don't think it gets into the teaching curriculum nearly as much as it should. One thing you brought up a number of times during this conversation, I think four to my count, is that you feel like things have gotten better, right, um, with AAC That's inclusion. Perfect. So can you, can you give us any ideas of, like, what are we doing better, and how can we reinforce that? Like, how can we help everyone do better? A couple of the things that we've done better is to work with core vocabulary and keep our eye more on generative language, lang words that, that people can put together into messages rather than giving them whole messages pre-constructed that they may or may not want. Um, so I think that's a huge, huge change. I don't see nearly so much anymore those, you know, eight pre-programmed sentences on a tech talk as we used to. And I think that, that's huge. I think we're looking more at our AAC users as not only having something to say, but having the wherewithal to say it, giving them the tools to do that. And I think that that has, um, that's been really, really big for our kids. I'm not running nearly so much into um, people, communication partners from all of those parents, teachers, SLPs, um, who don't think that the kids can communicate at all. They don't have anything to say. So that that's huge. Um, and I think that we've gotten a little bit more out there in terms of um, resources. Uh, not so much curriculum, unless you look at um, some of the language learning lab or um, Gail Van Tatenhoe's uh, Pixon kit. Um, but there are more materials out there and more information. Um, 
you know, the internet is a wonderful thing until it's not, but um, having that information at your fingertips uh, with just a Google search is Amazing. There was there was nothing out when, when I started, and for a long, long time, there was no way to get information into anybody's hands unless you you know knew somebody who was doing something and they could Xerox it for you. Um, so that's huge. Technology has come along and improved. The first device I ever had, we had to program every word in phonetically, um, and. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was painful. Um, I, I still have to trick certain devices into how to pronounce things. Mm -hmm. so I, I right, feel... and and all of the pronunciation exceptions. That was yeah, mind boggling. Mm -hmm. So that's wonderful. We we now have iPads, and there are some good robust apps out there. And so we've brought down the cost of the eight thousand dollar device. So I think all of those things are conspiring to make our implementation with AAC users more valuable, more uh, real uh, and genuine for them. Um, and, and we are getting those genuine purposes for communication rather than teaching and testing. Um, so I think, I think the field has come a long way in, um, in a short period of time. Susan, you, you touched on resources. And you have a ton of resources. Can you tell us a little bit about what you offer and where people can find you online? Oh, okay. So um, I have a blog. It's um, Kids Learn Language, and Kids has a Z, not an S. Um, and so I blog primarily about augmentative communication and language development. Um, and so I try to put um, information out there that is evidence-based, that is uh, stuff that I've experienced um, or, or have learned about, my experiences with specific kids that might be similar to other people's. Um, I try and write it in a very relaxed tone um, so that it's accessible to parents. Um, it's not just for SLPs or teachers. It's, um, it's written in a, in a fairly relaxed way, and I try to avoid jargon. Um, I do create a lot of resources uh, for augmentative communication. Largely for SLPs, but again, also accessible to parents and, and teachers. And I do get a lot of parents who uh, purchase those materials. Um, some of them are on my website, which is just susanberkowitz.net. Um, but I also have a large store um, on the Teachers Pay Teachers website. Um, the store is just my name. And, um, and I have uh, almost 400 resources. There are a lot of free handouts, um, which I encourage people to go and download and read. Um, I am in the process of updating them, but, um, but I try, again, to give lots of free information out there, um, get stuff into the hands of people who need it without them having to, uh, to pay for it or to struggle with it. And then I also have, obviously, paid resources that I hope teach people how to, to teach core words and to teach kids to generate language. I, I, have, um, I have stuff that's run off of um, Carol Zangari's Year of Core Words. So I have resources for two of her year's worth of words. Um, so that 288 word core words, which is a pretty good number. Um, I have materials that are based on um, the developmental learning maps. Uh, Karen Erickson's 40, 40, 40 core words. Um, I need a speech therapist. And, uh, <laughs> and a lot of other things that can be used either at home or at school uh, to build um, communication. I, I do a lot of book adaptations. Um, uh, so I, I would say you're you're prolific in your <laughs> in your creation oh, of, of resources. Okay. And I, I want to say also for especially for all the time you've been doing it, thank you so much for for what you've done for the field. I mean, that's that's. that's I, I like to think I do things here. right. <laughs> I, I don't like to do things and not do them well. So so I do try. I'm also writing a book, um, and it was originally primarily geared to parents uh, as a sort of how-to manual to teach your kid um, to communicate with AAC. Um, and then Rachel so kindly pointed out uh, about a year ago that what I really needed to do was to make it accessible to speech pathologists who didn't have training in AAC or a lot of experience in it. Um, most SLPs don't get it in their graduate work. It's not a required course. It's a, something you can do if your school happens to um, offer it and you're interested. 
And so I've, um, I've put it together as parents and professionals in partnership um, in AAC. So it's, here's, um, here's what the terminology means, here's what's out there um, and the range of it, here are ways that you can use it. And there are you know, activities and specific uh, things that you can do during those activities. I've created templates and I filled some of them in for people so you can get started right away. And so I'm hoping that um, it, will, it will fill a need. Um, I don't see anything out there that specifically does that for, for parents. And so I'm hoping that it will be seen as something positive um, and that people will, will use it. Well, That's I'm great. definitely really excited. We definitely talked about that. I guess it was about a year ago now. It was a while. Um, but I just think you're a wealth of knowledge, Susan, and you have so many great well, ideas you. on your blog and on social media. And so I just think it's going to be really exciting to put all those wonderful ideas in one place. Um, Susan is, is obviously all over the web. And in fact, if you look around speech science a little bit, I think you'll, you'll find her there too. Uh, so it's not too hard to, to spot, but we'll, we'll have all those links. If you have any questions for her, you're also welcome to, to send those through us, either via tech.speechscience.org or even better through our Facebook group, um, which is a great way to, to reach us to post questions. Just look for Talking with Tech and you'll, you'll find it. Um, I really like it when people post questions there because then everyone can benefit from the answers. Yeah. Right? And I'm, I'm always happy to answer questions if I know yeah. the answer. That's great. So, so check that out. And then also, if you're on iTunes, feel free to drop us a review. Um, we always appreciate that. The whole point of the podcast is to reach uh, more people and, and by leaving us a review or, uh, you know, by subscribing, that, that helps us to, you know, to find more folks. So I, I really appreciate it. You know, this is uh, Lucas Stuber again on behalf of Rachel Madel and Chris Begay with the amazing Susan Berkowitz, who's joined us from Mexico. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk to you all next week. Okay. Thank you.